Okay, uh, so I guess to start with, you want to just introduce yourself and uh, talk about your project or your various projects? Sure. Um, I'm David Insminger. I'm a college professor. I'm a folklorist, uh, a musician, a music journalist, um, all that wrapped into one. And my background is that about 2008, I went to the University of Oregon and decided to study folklore after 10 years of teaching English and became very interested in uh, digital archiving. And so what I started doing was uh, scanning in hundreds and then thousands of punk rock flyers and posters and ephemera and began to archive them on blogs and share them with the whole wild world. And what ends up happening is that I, I wrote a book about the subject as well called Visual Vitriol for the University of Mississippi, which is about a 300 page compendium of these same flyers together with sort of an analysis of them. And I treat them as sort of um, street art and folk art. It's art from the people. This project has been in particular to take my music journalism and to create a curated environment on Bibliolab. And what that allows a reader to do is experience sort of the magazine in a different sort of way. So traditionally, when you read a magazine, you just get this sort of well-manicured hard copy, or you get this website <clears throat> that, that looks like every other website. And so I had a 1,000 pages, and uh, I quit the magazine in 2005. It ran from 2000 to 2005. We did about seven issues. Um, it was a digest sized, and so it kind of looked like a book, but it has a limited shelf life, right, because the magazine stays up on the shelf for about a month or two, and then it disappears. So the question is, what do you do with all of this material? Now, I could have just sat on it, put it in a box, forgot about it, but I love the bands, I love the people, and I love the community. And so I approached Bibliolab about, hey, should we turn this into something print? And they suggested, well, we're moving towards these curated environments, these sort of digital archives. Since I was already interested in that, I said, yes, let's do this. And so what I was able to do is create these environments, these compendiums, these anthologies, and not just present the interviews, but present music and photos and letters and ephemera that traditionally you would never get with just a straight up magazine. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, <clears throat> what uh, is it, was it just your interest in, in punk rock that led you towards choosing punk rock as the medium for this? Or are they, you know, <laughs> have you found that it's more, they're more visually, their flyers are more visually artistic or something? Well, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, there's great rock and roll posters from the 1950s. You have the psychedelic boom in the 1960s. You have the arena rock in the 70s. But for me, punk rock is family values. My brother went to Chicago in 1980 and went to the Art Institute and became very involved and saw the cramps and Black Flag and people like that. My sister came home in high school when I was a little boy and she would be listening to Iggy Pop. Uh, she'd be listening to the Gun Club, David Bowie, on and, you know, on and on all the time. And so I was kind of reared in that environment. So when I would go visit my brother, he would do things like, hey, why don't you paint? Why don't you make your own clothes? Why aren't you doing a collage? Why don't you make your own fanzine? And he'd be giving me this stuff. And so very early on, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, I began to have bands. I picked up the drums. I started making my own uh, stories. And then I turned those stories into fanzines. I started taking photos. And I realized much later, you know, when I went back to college, that, oh, my God, I've always been a folklorist, and now I need to do something with it. Good deal. Can you tell us, um, tell us, David, a little bit about the technology side, particularly the Biblio Labs, the creator product, and how that helped facilitate this project, and just your overall experience with that? Right. And Mitchell can probably talk way more about the software side, but I will talk about it from the user side. Yes. Um, so something I'm accustomed to is blogging. I run about 20 blogs. I use WordPress. And the reason I use WordPress is because it's convenient, it's user-friendly, and it's intuitive. And so that's what I was looking for. If I were to build this a large anthology and it has 250 separate items within it, and any one of those items may be up to 10 or 12 pages long, um, I needed something that was convenient and efficient and fast and I could actually use. And so what I like about the BiblioLive feature is that once you create your user profile and you get in, you start using it, you start uploading the material, it's almost exactly like using uh, like a WordPress blog, right? It's got these nice templates, you fill in the captions. I mean, anybody who's been to college and used sort of some reference guy like Easy, Easy Bib, you can do this. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you, know, you got those working templates, you put in the information, you choose your materials. Later on, you can go edit them and whatnot. And so I think that software, which has improved over the last year, they've done, I think, two or three versions now, has become even more intuitive and user-friendly. And so what I do is I prepare all the material, 
I upload it into these templates. They uh, you know do what they need to do on the software, and and then it comes out on this other side, this sort of beautiful interactive thing where you have music, you have the photography, you have the text, and then it gets on iTunes or it gets on these uh, anthologies through Academia. Great, great. Uh, we were kind of talking before this. We were wondering what uh, maybe some of your favorite uh, artists are and, and who has the best posters. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's all about what style you prefer. I love punk rock. And so what happens is that I really like the really crude stuff, the sort of stuff that looks like it was drawn in a basement by an amateur or somebody naive or somebody almost childlike. And I really appreciate that stuff. Some people think it's ugly. Um, but obviously, I have uh, a real appreciation for someone like Raymond Pettibon, who did all the Black Flag posters. I mean, they're macabre, they're scary, they're intense, um, and they've gone on to be in galleries and be in books and be in museums. Um, I like my personal friend's art, who you know, who did flyers for us. I make my own art, and mostly clip art and things like that, and collage, sometimes a little bit of drawing. Um, so I, I, I kind of refrain by calling out favorites. You know, there's Jamie Hernandez, who went on to do Love and Rockets comics, and he was a fantastic illustrator. There was Sean Carey, who did Circle Jerks posters, and she, again, did wonderful, incredible illustrations, even for dirty magazines like Hustler and stuff. So those always rise to the top. Pusshead, who did stuff from Metallica, which you could, you know, everybody probably has seen. That stuff is amazing. But equally amazing is all these thousands of kids working on their own, you know, in these homes, in these basements, in these garages, doing it themselves, despite how crude, despite how awkward, despite how imperfect. To me, that's really interesting. I have a bit of a related question to that. Have you had any of the early artists, the ones that were anonymous, that have, that have seen their work in, in your yeah. publication or on the digital side that have reached out to you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so what happens when you make them available on these blogs, right? is that anytime you type into Google, you're looking for a Black Flag 1982 poster, pop, you know, it comes up in one of my blogs maybe. I've done about, I would say probably 2,000 images have been digitized, maybe a little bit more, and it's, I still got a huge pile. But what happens is the anonymous ones that people say, hey, I did that, and they'll leave you a message or they'll leave you feedback, right? And then you begin to understand the essence of community. You begin to understand the essence of openness. The essence of transparency is that you, you could not do this otherwise. If that wasn't a book, what would you do? Contact the publisher and say, hey, that was my work. Uh, you know, maybe you guys give me some credit. In the blog or in this system, it's instantaneous. We can change it. We can go back and say, oh, this is by so-and-so. And so what was an absence becomes a presence, right? What had otherwise disappeared in terms of the creator comes back to us and we show our appreciation. And I think that's what makes it very unique is that you really, it's about the community strain. Absolutely. Very cool, very cool. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, what, where do you see your work going? Do you see expanding beyond punk rock art and uh, music? Um, well, that's kind of my forte. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what else I do. But right now, I'm really trying to sequence the visual DNA of punk rock culture. So my end goal, and I've collected about 5,200 posters so far, is to literally be able to sequence the entire visual history of the movement. I know it's pretty far-fetched. It's, uh, it's climbing a big mountain, but I think I'll, you know, I'm going to give it my best shot. On the other side, I do have a new compendium coming out because in the 90s when I was working on punk rock, I was also working on Roots Rock. And so I worked for a magazine called Thirsty Ear. And in doing so, I was interviewing Ralph Stanley, uh, uh, Dave Alvin, Tom Russell, Robert O'Keefe, singer-songwriters, country artists, rustic kind of people, performers. And I'm going to create a compendium around that. And again, it's not just going to be the interview. So what I also offer is up is postcards. I'll offer pieces of ephemera, poetry that I have from some of these people. And to give you, again, it's, it, you know, it's not that final product that matters to me. It's about seeing the process of how something came about and to see the relationship between the writers and the performers. Things like that. Interesting. Are there, um, are there other artifacts, David, that you've rolled into this project in, in addition to the, to the poster art? Are there other yeah. things like set lists and that kind of things that you found? Well, I, yeah, I do have some set lists and things like that, and I do include those. Those are kind of interesting because you never knew who actually did the set list, so I don't always use them. And if they're real or not, it's hard to actually say, okay, is this authentic? Um, but one of the things I like to share is buttons. The other thing I like to share is letters. The other thing I like to share is other pieces of ephemera. And so when you go into the collection um, Bibliolab, what you get is some original letters to me back in the 1980s when I was doing these very small batches of fanzines, like you know, 60, 70 copies, and then people would write me. And it gives you that sense of the underground community, right? 
and the discourse of it. And I think it's important that you see that. So that's kind of a transparency, right? Because when you pick up Rolling Stone, you don't get the letters. I mean, you get the letters to the editor, but you don't get the unadulterated primary source. And so what I offer up people is these really handwritten letters from these people, whether it's an artist, whether it's a fan, whether it's somebody else who's doing a magazine. And I, I as much as I, I can, try to share that stuff with people so they get a, a much broader and fuller sense. Plus, in terms of researchers who may be accessing it, it's super important because you can go into uh, a reference site on the web. So you can go to Google Scholar or something like that, or you can go to Academic Search Premier, uh, JSTOR, but you're not going to get primary stuff. What you're mostly going to get is secondary material. So the more I can provide that the researchers, that cuts down on time, that cuts down on travel, that cuts down on access, and it provides as much as I can all in one spot, sort of a one stop and shop. Well, David, is there anything that you'd like to leave us with that we didn't cover possibly? It's been a really interesting discussion. We appreciate you sitting down with us. Right. Right. And I think what I would like to stress that I think is really interesting about BiblioLab is moving self-publishing forward. Uh, Mitch and I have talked about typically when you talk about self-publishing, you talk about putting your own book, right? Uh, maybe an ebook. Well, in this case, think about people creating these environments. Think about research and how it becomes much more democratic, much more pluralized, much more participatory. When people could put on an array of their materials onto these websites, onto these platforms, and onto these the, the software. I think that's where we're heading. Is that you know we hear these commercials about everyone taking their photos and uploading them and Instagram and things like this. What about your personal archives? That's where we're going. All those old letters, all those old booklets that you have, all those old photographs that you have, all that forms these anthologies. The history of America is going to change drastically. We know very little, I think, up to this point, but very soon by sharing and participating and getting the material out there, making it accessible, our vision of this country will change and become much more true, I think, much more authentic and much more in tune with reality. That's great. Great parting words. Awesome. Well, we appreciate it, David. Thank you very right. much. For Thank you, guys. Talking with us. It's been All great. Right. No problem. <laughs>